Good evening, everyone. The October 25th, 2022 regular meeting of the Everett Public Schools Board of Directors is now called to order. We'll first start with our student representative, Alice Gilbertson. She will present the land acknowledgement for this evening. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Kosalish, Snohomish, and Tulalip people. We express our deepest respect and gratitude to the ancestors of this land, whose shoulders we stand. In Everett Public Schools, we strive to create equi or, sorry. Sorry equitable outcomes and build a culture of inclusive belonging for all students, teachers, staff, and community. Thank you very much, student Rep. Gilberson. Will we all please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will the secretary please call the roll? President Liz Sane. Present. Vice President Mitchell. Present. Director Nichols. Director Mason. Present. Director Herman. Present. Student Representative Colley. Present. Student Representative Gilbertson. Present. Thank you very much. Our first item of business is the adoption of the agenda. Dr. Salzman, would you mind introducing the, tonight's agenda? Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and to the public this evening. Tonight's agenda contains the following. The superintendent's report, a segment for board comments, a segment for public comments, a segment for routine business, a segment for information and discussion, and a segment for upcoming agenda items. Since publishing the agenda, the following changes were made to the agenda. Item 5.01, adoption of the agenda. The timing sheet was updated. Item 7.01, superintendent's report. The presentation was added. And item 10.18, approval of membership for the Gertrude Jackson Memorial Fund Advisory Board. The roster was updated to correct the spelling of a name. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salzman. Is there a motion for the adoption of the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved by Director Mason and seconded by Director Herman. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, we'll now proceed to the vote. All those in favor, please say, respond by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. The motion carries. The agenda has been adopted. We'll now move to section 6.01 which is recognitions. There are no recognitions scheduled for this agenda. Moving to section 7.0, the superintendent's report. Dr. Salzman. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors and the public this evening. First, I'd like to comment on our instructional review process as we visit schools and develop the big rocks as we help students and we collaborate together with teachers and administrators and staff how we help our students every day. Emerson is not shown here today because theirs was today. Oh, cool. And it was another great review by Emerson. We visited classrooms, we saw teachers, and we saw their amazing, happy students in action. It was really nice to see that. And again, when we all work together, better results for our youngsters. Learning Improvement Day, what an event. That's the emails I've been getting, just what an event. It was wonderful seeing over 2,000 Everett Public Schools team members last Friday for our Learning Improvement Day. Training was centered on RULER, which is an emotional intelligence approach utilizing the skills of recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, and regulating our emotions. Nationally known author and founder of the Yale Center of Emotional Intelligence, Dr. Mark Brackett came to Everett to lead the morning instruction and well-perceived, and we are very thankful for all that attended 
And we all believe that we learned a great deal about social emotional work that we have to do for all students and staff. What an event on Saturday. Not only did the sun come out at a perfect time, but the 32nd annual Puget Sound Festival of Bands took place. An incredible show of support for the arts and schools, honoring marching bands all over the state and region. Celebrating the great student musicians and, perfor and performers came to our town and kudos to the Cascade team and parents and every booster, but also a public shout out to our mayor who was there with me during the day as many folks came to see our great city of Everett. It was a great event and to thank you staff that came out. Thank you for being there and supporting our youngsters. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Salzman. We'll now move to section 8.0 and that is board comments. The purpose of board comments is to share what directors and representatives have encountered in their work in the district. So we'll allow, let's see, let's start. I don't want to start at the students again because I, won't, I didn't want to put you on the spot. Let's start with Dr. Herman. Okay, perfect. Thank you, President Lassane. Uh, actually, there's been a lot happening since the last regular meeting. I want to thank Director Nichols, who's just running a little late tonight, but uh, for representing the Everett School Board at the WASDA General Assembly. I think that advocating to state decision makers is a really important part of our work here. Also, a thank you to Christopher Ferreira, Safety and Security Coordinator for the district. I was able to attend the reunification drill, um, and what struck me was not only what a, a big event that was, but the recognition that that is just one slice of our safety and security plan. And so a thank you to him and his team for that thoughtful work and the people that showed up and the feedback, always improving and getting better. So there was, um, I think some lessons learned there, but it went really smoothly. Uh, the ruler training was fantastic. So thank you, um, Dave Peters, especially and the team for setting that up. I uh, just finished reading the book this past weekend and I saw a lot of connections to what we do throughout the district, both adults and children. And it actually took me back to the student panel that we heard during the summer board retreat and just really connected with that. Um, I'm excited. We really want all of our kids to have that Uncle Marvin experience. And uh, so I, I can't say enough about that. Let's connect tonight and the thought exchange, the, the um, feedback that we're getting. I want to thank Kathy Reeves and her team for the thought exchange going on now through October 31st and the let's connect all the admins that were there putting that on. It was wonderful to meet with parents, um, have parents be able to meet with staff and that obviously though makes for a very long day for all of you. So thank you for doing that. And lastly, high school and beyond. Last week I was able to attend the one at Jackson fantastic array of booths, college, career, um, and military and the information sessions. So the parents I talked to, it was interesting, freshmen and sophomore, they're just getting a lot of ideas. So it was great to have that event at the schools, another long day for our administrators. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Um, it's been some time since our last meeting, so there has been a lot um, going on. Um, busy, busy few months as we get the school year started. Um, let's see, I wanted to congratulate our two National Merit Scholarship semifinalists from Jackson High School. Um, I have been looking hard at how to pronounce their names, and I'm not going to butcher them publicly, but um, two fantastic individuals. Um, I was surprised our district only had two out of four high schools. Um, and my bias may come that my high school alma mater is Interlake High School, which had 43 this year. <laughs> so um, I'm just hoping that maybe we have an opportunity to increase those numbers over time as we recover from the pandemic and move forward. Um, I also got to attend the Jackson High School um, and beyond night, uh, full parking lot. I couldn't believe when I pulled in how far I had to park away from the building. Full gym, um, which just means that there's a real um, desire for parents and students to get that kind of information. Um, and I'm glad that we're doing it early in the year. And I'm glad that there were a lot of underclassmen there just with the getting the ideas. 
Um, and I'm looking forward to on Thursday attending for a, a short time before I go off to a instructional review over at Everett High School. Um, and they're they're choosing to do theirs during the day so all students can participate, which I think is great. It might be a bit of a challenge for some of the parents, but um, I'm, I'm hoping that yields um, good results for them as well. Um, I also got to attend the North Middle School Instructional Review. Um, given that I'm not a, a liaison to, that's not one of my liaison schools, it was really fun to get in that building once again. Such a beautiful building, <laughs> such an amazing building. Um, and, and meet the staff and get an opportunity to walk around and, and see those students there. And then lastly, I just also want to comment on the ruler training. I just felt so uh, privileged to be able to learn alongside all the other people in the district. Um, I think the fact that we are all on the same page just makes a tremendous impact in our district. So um, I want to thank Dr. Salsman for allowing the board to join in on that one. It was truly just a transformational day um, for me personally, if nothing else. So thank you. Reformation. That's my husband. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it, it is um, a lot of it, you know, it has been a month since we last met. So it is, yeah, yeah more than that, um, that I did attend um, an IR at Gateway and then today at Emerson and also a visit to, to Penny Creek Elementary. I really, really do enjoy seeing students learning um, in the classroom, um, have seen teachers meeting to discuss um, how they can help students and was able to look at the 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 iReady charts on a couple classrooms at Emerson today uh, one of the fifth grade classrooms there was a young lady who had both of her rows completely filled out to the edge and I went over to chat with her and um, I said so do you like learning and she was like well I do like reading more than math and I said but you're you're performing so well well I like working hard and she had um, a hijab on and with some bling on it. So I did comment that and she sort of pulled it down to show off all of her bling. So it was just um, just so wonderful to, to, to help see, look at kids like that. Um, uh, Director um, uh, Herman and I were at the Jackson, excuse me, the Heatherwood Let's Connect. And as we've been all speaking about ruler, so I'm gonna continue this. We, we did have two conversations with moms um, asking about it um, in relation to people of color. Um, both of them happen to be. I'm more than halfway through with the book. Um, I'm glad you were able to finish it. I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Um, the book is Permission to Feel. And that what he has written is that part of our, what we need to learn is that everybody doesn't react the same way we do. And so that it's based on cult culture, um, religion, age, and so how to not be judging because people don't react the way we do because the concern of these two parents is there an expectation with ruler that that everybody would have to behave white and he does not write that way he writes that we have to be um, emotional scientists and understand why somebody is is reacting the way they did um, people have already spoken about how what a wonderful um, event it was and for us to be included um, in that it, it, it really does help like you said, us all be on the same page. Um, at the event, we did talk to um, uh, Dr. Bolton about um, you know, getting parents involved. And I know that is the plan, if not this year, next year to give them the information. And um, I can say that it is making me, I believe a better mother, hopefully a better board member and a better human being as I learned to be an emotional scientist. Um, also had the pleasure of being at a breakfast um, for the, to support the Cascade cheerleaders and got to see um, Miss Binta over there. And um, that was a lot of fun, saw staff too, and just loved the ability to, to, to support our kids doing things. And then lastly, um, was at a Cocoon House silk auction and just really appreciate their efforts and what, uh, what my family is able to do to support the homeless in this county. Um, I think that, that all the partners that we have um, that can support our students are just um, a very important um, for how we're able to do the work that we do. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. I will turn to the students' reps. I didn't want to put you on the spot, but is um, Representative Gilbertson, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Um, yes, I would like to say that I was lucky enough to be involved with the robotics meet that was held in Kent. Um, I'm no longer in the club because it took a large time out of my day that I'm not able to put in anymore. <laughs> 
but it was wonderful to see our team just work together and be so constructive like that. And we had, the robot did fall apart halfway through, <laughs> but they were so quick on it to put it back together and work so well together. And I'd like to say that the homecoming week at EHS turned out wonderful. Our leadership team did a great job at decorating and theming our A building hallway, hallways. Uh, there was a horror themed hallway and a Pixar theme. Pixar being one of my favorites, it won the competition of best theme in the hallways. Um, our teachers did a really great job of dressing up and dressing up for the spirit week. And so did students all getting to see everyone was just amazing and that everyone wanted to participate. Um, we had themes like there was pajama day, surfer versus bikers day, back to the future, and then school spirit day. Um, and yeah, it was just wonderful all, all around having that spirit week. And after that, um, the football game, I was lucky enough to be able to go to that. And I'd like to say that the tailgate was very nice, but set in a very cramped portion. So that was a little difficult because there were like only two rows that people could walk, but it was fun to see everyone there. And um, I got to dress up in spirit with my EHS shirt and blue and gold face paint to cheer on the team, stood out in the rain to be close by. And I was really excited to see the homecoming Senate, like all the people that were voted. I was really excited to see all of them walk on the field and <coughs> just hearing everyone cheer every time. Um, and I am proud to say that our high school won the football game. So yeah. Um, and then the homecoming dance, it was put on amazingly. Um, the theme for it was Oscars and they did a great job decorating for that. And I think one of my favorite parts is this is my second school dance going to and they sec they we have the two gyms, the large one and the smaller one. And they use the large one for the dancing and the music and then they section off the small one for games. So if people just want to relax, then they get that chance. And I like to say, I enjoyed dancing with my friends and playing games like that and just overall being with people again. Because I like it's like this was our first homecoming dance in so long, and so many people yes. got to do that because of COVID. Um, and the last thing I'd like to say is kind of related to Halloween coming up. That I was happy that my librarian stopped me while I was in the library and wanted me to join a competition that they're kind of doing, just putting on in the library of a two sentence horror story and that people anyone who participates gets a prize just like a piece of candy and that she recognized me from being in a writing club last year since i've worked pretty hard on building that writing skill so yeah thank you very much thank you representative coffee um just wanted to say that it's been a great start to the new year um it has been a while since we met as all of you have said um but we've had a lot of football games. Our season's coming to an end now. Um, it's been super fun. And we just had homecoming week too. Um, it was my second homecoming also, even though I am a senior. It was, um, my last homecoming was freshman year. So it was great to go back and have a normal homecoming and have a normal year this year. So that's really exciting. And um, yeah, things have been good. So thank you. It's great to have our student reps be able to provide us with what's happening in the schools today, especially the high schools, because I remember my spirit week at, in high school, and that was only a couple of years ago. But I remember pajama day and the back to the future day we had at our spirit week in high school only a couple of years ago. But as everybody has mentioned, it has been a long time since our last regular board meeting, much as taken been taken place as everybody can contest to we had an exciting leadership uh, learning improvement day from um, you know social emotional ruler what I took away most impactfully was what I perceive and what you perceive as an injustice 
can be totally different. And that we need to understand is that people come with different perceptions. And that really stuck with me because it, it says so much of how, you know, how we have to empathize with other people and how we have to accept the fact that what they perceive is totally different what we perceive. Also, I must admit, and thank you, Dr. Salzman, we had COVID and flu shots right here in the CRC. And I had the great opportunity of standing in line and getting someone to poke me in both arms that day. So I was very happy to do that. And I saw community members involved as well. And one five-year-old, a five-year-old can sit up there and take a shot and just say, wasn't nothing. And I said, oh my gosh, this five-year-old, I gotta do just like this five-year-old. What a great opportunity for our community and for our staff and students. So thank you very much for arranging that. I attended uh, instructional review at Eisenhower, at Monroe, and at Silver Lake. And I found them very, very informative and very great. The schools were fantastic. It's great to get back into school. And like the student reps mentioned, it's been so long. So I'm so glad that we can get back in. I happened to attend a Madison um, Let's Connect night. And so that was very informative. I got to sit with families and hear their perspectives on what's going on in the district. And I really found that wonderful. And I think I brought some back and I shared them with you. So that was great. I also had the opportunity to uh, attend a special education PTA night on Zoom. And one thing that is, it's taught me is that we have a new technology that's at our back end call. And we can still continue the work of our groups out there, if not in person, on Zoom. And we need to take advantage of all that. We don't need to go back to pre-pandemic and take away that new technology that we've learned. And so that was great to be able to sit there and listen to parents and hear their concerns, and especially from the special ed uh, PTA side of the PTA group. So that was fantastic. We also had a special board of board meeting on school updates where we got to find out what's going on in the district and the concerns and challenges that we face and as we move forward with the school uh, year and what parents are and our students are and the challenges we face of bringing our students up to what they were at prior to the end of the last school year, as well as pre pandemic area so that was good. It's been a great start to the new school year, and it helps to set the stage for how we're going to be focused on the next couple of months and the next uh, quarter of the year and the rest of the year. So I'm excited for the new months and what lays ahead of us as we continue to go forward. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to our next section, which is public comments. We have Let's go. Do we normally go online first or do in person first? Okay, let's go and hear from our online. We have two public speakers online. The first is Glenn Garland at a Gateway Middle School parent. Jared, would you please promote Mr. Oh. Garland to the panelists so they can join yeah, via yeah. Zoom? Oh, he's not there? Okay, we'll go to the second. The second speaker is Lauren Griffin, a Tambark Creek Elementary School. Garrett, would you please promote Ms. Griffin to the panelists so they can join via Zoom? Our guest speaker will need to accept the panelists and request to join the meeting. Once you join the meeting, are they there? There. I'm here. Fantastic. I was waiting for you to make sure you heard us. Thank, thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Um, I am just here as a parent to a elementary school student. Um, and as this month is ADH, National ADHD Month, um, and ADHD is the most common neurobehavioral disorder diagnosed for children. 
Um, I do want to go ahead and advocate for not only this group, but all elementary school students. Um, as I just noticed in the 2022 school year, the Everett School District cut outdoor recess for our students by 15 minutes a day for a total of two recess sessions to equal a total daily retime recess of 30 minutes. And that's, so that is cutting it by 33 minute, 33% 33 from the 45 minutes that was historically offered in the 2021, 2022 school year. Um, and also cutting it from what our neighboring school districts um, offer as for example, the Snohomish School District does still offer 45 minutes of total daily recess cut divided into three equal recess sessions. Given what we know from many national international studies on the benefits in outdoor time to our elementary age students, whether ADHD diagnosed or not, I am here to advocate for the return of this previously offered daily total of 45 minutes of recess to our children. This is something that is apparent, I, I believe would greatly benefit our children on a physical, physical and mental level and would cost very little to the district. The AAP research does show that children who spent more time outside had less anger and aggression and a better control on impulses as well as an increased ability to focus. Um, so I, I just felt this in my heart that this is just something that I think that would really help our, our kids. Thank you very much, Ms. Griffin. I appreciate that. At this time, um, you can return to the attendee status. I don't know if you can still hear me, but you can return to your attendee status to view the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. We'll now move to our in-person comments. And I would like to ask if Ms. Anna Garbe will come, I hope I pronounced that correctly, would yes. come up. You have three minutes in which you can speak. You'll see some uh, red, yellow, green blips on your on the podium there. The green will indicate that you have three minutes. Once it reaches red, it will be your time is over. Okay. So please. Thank you. Thank you. Again, my name is Anna Garibay. I am a mother of a middle school student, Armando Acuna Garibay, um, another student with ADHD, uh, has suffered um, a lot of uh, incident, incidents, reports, more than 11 up to, you know, uh, up to the date. And I did request a copy um, in front of uh, Kathy Woods um, to for my for myself to keep what you know plan covering the other students num and names um, as the law a lot, you know follows. Um, but I do not agree on the punishment for a, a student, a sixth grade student, even though I understand that um, it's not considered sexual assault because it's an 11 year old. Um, but if you are grabbing someone's private parts, the state says it's sexual assault by being aggressive to that person is assault. And I don't believe uh, a contract, a no contact contract that has been repeated multiple times, uh, you know, that it's obviously not working because the other kid keeps on breaking the contract over and over and over. And my son already has depression his depression is getting worse. Uh, his medicine is just uh, just got increased yesterday. I myself suffer of depression. I am falling in depression because there's nobody that can control, you know, um, what this kid is doing, not just physically, mentally, but sexually. 
And I think it should not be tolerated and it should not be treated like they're kindergartens because they're not. We are just, sorry, we're just, you know, allowing them to grow like that, mm -hmm. to keep on growing like that, to get away with things, oh, you know, more and more. Mm -hmm. And I've been a victim of sexual abuse, sexual assault. I, I have suffered from it, and I don't take it like it's a game. Like it should not be taken like it's a game, period. Thank you very much, Mrs. Garvey. We will look into this. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will now move to section 10.0. That section is our consent agenda. Dr. Salzman, will you provide an introduction to the consent agenda? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors and the public this evening. The board's consent agenda includes repetitive business items such as meeting minutes, personnel actions, expense vouchers, surplus lists, gifts, grants, and recurring contracts. Sometimes it includes items that occur less frequently, but are of routine business nature. These items are usually reviewed by the board in the Friday report, one or more weeks before the board meeting. That gives directors time to ask staff questions or to consider a discussion about the policy implications of those items. The board votes on the consent agenda in a single motion. By its definition, a consent agenda is not debatable. In the case of this consent agenda, the superintendent's office received and answered one question regarding the personnel report. The consent agenda is presented as published for board approval. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salzman. A motion to adopt the consent agenda is now in order. So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved by Director Mincho and seconded by Director Herman to approve the consent agenda. Does any director wish to remove an item from the consent agenda and place it under new business section of the agenda? Hearing no requests, we'll now proceed to the vote. All those in favor, please respond by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. The motion carries and the consent agenda is approved. Moving to section 11.0, our strategic progress monitoring. We see that there is no strategic progress monitoring report scheduled for this meeting. We'll now move to information and discussion. We have something provided pre to present in this section as our annual achievement presentation. And Dr. Matthews is currently at the podium, ready to start. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. You may go. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'm uh, pleased to be here tonight to present the annual achievement report tonight there we go <laughs> tonight i'll be sharing with you our district and school results talk uh, about the district and state comparisons our comparison with 25 largest school districts in the state the iReady diagnostic and then progress monitoring with performance matters so as we speak tonight, I want to look at it from a couple of different frames. The first is um, the frame of clarity, context, and candor. And we have talked about this quite a lot this year, uh, the importance of understanding with clarity our performance overall context. So looking at comparisons and trends, and then candor, what are the focus uh, points for us this year as we look at our data? We're also going to look at it from the frame of trailing and leading indicators. So when we talk about trailing indicators, we think about summative data in the past that guides our work moving forward. But we also need to look at the leading indicators. So our fall iReady diagnostic, as well as common 
formative and summative assessments that um, teachers give throughout the year. We'll start with these uh, trailing indicators. Um, so on our state assessment, if we uh, added up all of the students who took the Smarter Balance and WACAS, the Washington Comprehensive Assessment of Science test this year, uh, you would note that we had a 64% passing rate in English language arts, 49.4% in math, and 55.8% in science. And what this means overall is that four out of 10 students in English language arts, five out of 10 in math, and four out of 10 in science did not meet standard. And so we have to keep that in mind as we work with our students this year to help to get them to standard by this spring. When we look at our data by uh, grade level, you'll notice that in ELA, there's a span of about 10%. So regardless of the grade, our scores came in between 59.8 and 67.2%. It's a little bit of up and a little bit of down, but everyone is within that range. With math, however, you can see that we started actually above the level of ELA at third grade, but as students get older in our system, less and less of them are meeting standard. And this is something that we have been focusing on um, over time. On the Washington Comprehensive Assessment of Science, our fifth graders uh, had uh, met proficiency at 64.1%. Our eighth graders were lower at 48%, um, and our um, 11th graders higher at 55%. When we look at our performance relative to the state, Everett Public Schools students outperformed students across the state in every grade level and subject area. And you can see uh, in this top right box uh, that we outperformed them in many cases in double digits. Uh, when we look at our performance relative to the state in terms of growth, so from the fall of last year to the spring. Mm -hmm. And you'll recall that we did take um, an assessment this fall, talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Um, the amount of growth that our students achieved, again, outpaced the state, students across the state in every subject and grade level with the exception of eighth grade science and um, high school ELA, so 10th grade ELA. Other than those two areas, our students grew more than students across the state. In this chart, you can see the performance of our students in grades three through eight and 10 on the ELA Smarter Balanced. In orange, you will see the 2019 scores. So this is the typical Smarter Balanced assessment that we've taken for several years. In gray, you see the 21 score. So as you'll recall, in the spring of 21, the state um, had a waiver to uh, reschedule that assessment to the fall of the 21-22 school year. In addition, that assessment was considerably shorter and it did not have extended response writing or performance tasks in math. So it's a very different test than the 2019 test. The 22 test in um, blue, much more similar to the 2019 test, except slightly shorter. So it still had the extended response and performance tasks, much more like the 2019 test. Um, it was not a surprise to see this dip in the gray. And, and that's true across the state, primarily because we gave students a test based on the prior year standards 12 to 16 weeks after they had instruction. <laughs> so um, not a great way uh, to test. What we really want to be looking at is that movement to this uh, blue bar, the 22 scores, and how we are recovering. And so um, in ELA, uh, we had substantial recovery toward that 2019, not quite there, uh, but at least in fifth and uh, seventh grade, almost 10%, so just above 9% um, gains. And this is looking at each grade level over time. And so there are different students in these groups. And it's helpful sometimes to look here at our cohort trends. So this group of students began uh, third grade in 2019. They were in fifth grade in 2021. There was no test in 2020. And sixth grade in 2022. 
So they had been at 67.7, they're at 62.3 last spring. So that's a pretty strong recovery. Uh, our next group is fourth to sixth to 10th grade or to seventh grade. And you can see a greater dip in that sixth grade bar. Uh, but again, they made some progress toward um, recovering toward the 2019 profic proficiency rate. A little less well as students get older. And so here is our students that started in fifth grade in 2019, and then we're at seventh and eighth grade at 59.8. This is the same information for math, and you can see it is a very different chart in that it does decline as time goes on uh, across the grade levels. One thing to notice, though, is that the amount of recovery was much greater, especially at third, fourth, and fifth grade, over 10% in each of those grades. When we look at their that cohort data, you can see that we have much farther to go in math in terms of getting back to the level of proficiency that we were at. So here you see the um, fourth, sixth, and seventh grade cohorts from last year's so our current eighth graders at 45.2%. And then, um, the current ninth grade at 41.3%, uh, so very little recovery for that group. When we look at um, science, it is, um, it's an interesting pattern. <laughs> <laughs> Fifth grade, as you can see, uh, scoring right around 64 to 65% each year. Mm -hmm. uh, even during that, um, the 21 year, and remember this test didn't change, so this was the same test in each of these years. In eighth grade, scores uh, did decline. Um, and in 11th grade, they went up. And you might recall from the 2019 presentation, um, this was a time period where we shifted from um, a biology test to the WACAS. And so some groups of students took two tests and um, did not show up for in the same level that we expect out of our students. So we did have um, an increase in our performance at high school. If you look at the cohorts, this group of fifth graders at 65.3 um, had a proficiency rate of 48.1% in 2022. So um, certainly a concern with that drop mm -hmm. and uh, less of a drop between our eighth grade and our 11th grade students, 64.9 to 65.3. So when we look at um, our schools, you are seeing here in green the percentage of students who are in level three in ELA on the third grade exam, and in blue in level four. Uh, the number represents those that met standards. So, um, and I think that you're gonna see this on each of the slides, there is quite a range. And um, schools are working hard to um, improve their scores and each of them, as you know from the instructional reviews, um, have plans to do so. So this is our third grade um, ELA. Uh, fourth grade, we have a couple of uh, stair steps in this uh, that are interesting uh, between Whittier and Silver Firs, for example. Just a little bit of a dip there. In fifth grade, a uh, similar pattern, slightly higher performance um, on our, stu our schools that are um, generally struggling more. And then uh, this is our uh, middle school, grades six, seven, and eight. So we have Gateway and Heatherwood. Um, and there's a gap between those two schools and uh, North Evergreen um, and um, Eisenhower. Uh, less pronounced in math, as you will see. So our third grade uh, math, again, a range, as you can see from uh, almost 91% to 28%. Um, and clusters of schools in this state is not quite the stair step that you saw in um, English language arts. Fourth grade, uh, fourth grade has the same pattern in um, ELA. Uh, where there's a slight um, stair step between <coughs> kind of the um, top four schools and the remaining ones. And then fifth grade uh, math. One thing that you'll notice um, in each of these uh, representations 
is the percentage of um, level four gets um, higher uh, as as you go toward the top. So there's less level threes in some schools than level fours. This is our uh, mathematics, not quite as big a gap as there was in English language arts, but we still see Gateway and Heatherwood performing higher than Eisenhower and Evergreen and North. And then um, English language arts and mathematics for our high schools. And you can see that um, math continues to lag English language arts as we saw in the district data as well. We look at uh, the Washington Comprehensive Assessment of Science. We see a similar um, pattern of um, many more level three, though, uh, than we saw in the other data sets. Um, but the range, again, is 93 to 30%, so it's about the same spread. And then this is eighth and um, 11th grade. And again, um, Heatherwood and Gateway, a little higher performance, but not as much of a gap as there had been in ELA or in math. All right. So let's talk a little bit about um, context. So this is a uh, graph, this is a um, table, excuse me, uh, that we use to look at our performance against the 25 largest school districts in the state. And in this column, you see the ranking of free and reduced lunch from lowest to highest. So Lake Washington at the top at 9.7% ranked first. And um, Yakima at 84% ranked 25th. We are uh, about two thirds of the way at 10th at 43.2%. Then for each of the years and grade levels and tests, uh, we have ranked performance from highest to lowest. So if you see here in 2022, Lake Washington is number one. And if you look at those top four um, schools, so the four lowest free and reduced lunch rates, you see lowest free and reduced lunch rate, number one has the highest performance. Uh, what is um, something to be very proud of is that though we are 10th for free and reduced lunch, we are fifth in our performance when we rank against these schools, which means that we are um, outperforming schools with lower free and reduced lunch rates. The dark blue, by the way, is the top third of schools. The um, light blue is the middle third and the gray is the bottom third. So you can see across the board, third, fourth, and fifth grade, every test, fifth. And if we look at middle school, you'll see a similar um, pattern and it is the same, um, it's the same data, obviously, or setup of that data. Uh, we ranked fifth in um, sixth grade, seventh grade um, ELA and sixth in eighth grade ELA, sixth grade math, seventh grade math, eighth grade math and science. So outperforming um, our free and reduced lunch rate. In um, high school, we had the same um, situation. We were performing higher than our free and reduced lunch rate. Uh, however, slightly less well in English language arts and uh, math and exceptionally well in science. So we ranked first in science and eighth and seventh in um, ELA and math. <coughs> so this is a look of the um, exact same data, but instead of looking at it in terms of relative performance, this is a heat map of um, actual absolute performance. So as schools get closer to 100% proficiency, the dark, the blue gets darker. And as schools get to zero um, proficiency, the um, cells get darker green or red, excuse me. So same uh, ranking. And here we are, we are still um, fifth. And you can see across the board, we're um, in the gray. So this is to say that not just our relative performance, but our um, absolute performance in the elementary school, um, we're doing very well. Middle school, see a similar um, pattern. However, we're starting to see some orange in those math um, cells at sixth and um, seventh and eighth grade. Um, and this speaks to our um, overall performance as well in those areas. And then in high school, 
we see that same pattern where we have more orange in math and more gray in ELA. Um, and science, uh, though first, is uh, right in the middle at that light gray color. So this is a way to look at our, um, our recovery, essentially. So here we have Everett in this gray dot, and to the left of Everett are the schools with the lower free and reduced lunch rate, and they're in order. So you see Lake Washington, remember 9.7% on the far left, and to the right, Yakima with 84%. And we are right here in the middle. The green dot represents 2019, the orange 2021, and the blue 2022. So it's not a surprise when you look at most of these schools that the orange is um, on the low end. And this, by the way, is elementary um, third grade English language arts. What we want to see is a tight relationship between that green and blue dot because that really represents recovery. So when we look down here at Yakima, there's a big diff distance. In fact, the orange and blue dot are very close together, so not much um, growth in this year. Um, on the other scale of things is um, Bellevue, where the dots are very, very close. And here we are with our 2022 uh, performance. And so if you look at those other districts that uh, ranked lower than we did, you can see that many of them, most of them, uh, have a much greater spread between that 2021 and the 2022 um, data. All right, so candor. Uh, I think you can see that we need to work in math. That's um, certainly true. We also need to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all of our students. And uh, there continues to be a gap with our uh, multilingual learners. Um, you can see here the um, English language learners as OSPI mm -hmm. reports them. So I know we are calling them multilingual learners um, versus their non-ELL uh, peers. Low income students, there's a gap between non low income students, it's less pronounced than um, ELL students, and then our students with disabilities, which is similar to the gap that we see in our English language arts. And then when we look at our um, subgroups by ethnicity, American Indian, Alaska Native, our Black and African American, our Hispanic and Latino, and our Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander students all really continue to have this gap with our Asian, white, and two or more races students. All right, so let's talk about the leading indicators. This is uh, data from our fall um, iReady diagnostic, and you're looking at grades one through five. Um, I'll point out that um, on the top of this graph in the hashtag green, 26% of our students uh, started the year combined in all um, grade levels, uh, mid or above grade level. So they came in with very good skills. 17% uh, came at early on grade level, which means that they are ready to learn the, the, um, the standards of this grade level, and then 30% at um, one year behind. Now it's September. So we don't expect fifth graders to have all the standards, right? Being uh, at the fourth grade standards, not necessarily deficiency unless you're really, really at the, the tail end of that set of standards at the very beginning of fourth grade. Uh, of concern are the 13 and 14% of students who are respectively one or two or more years behind or three or more. And so uh, when we look at these students across the grade levels, these are the ones that really um, need significant interventions. And some of that um, is in the classroom through um, uh, for online instruction through iReady and some um, our pull out programs, et cetera, and after school. Uh, this year, we are also uh, providing the diagnostic in grades six, seven, and eight. And so you can see um, here with our middle school students, we have 27% of our students between two. Um, uh, between two or more grade levels uh, below, and 14% um, of those are three grade levels below. So that's a concern. And this is in reading, so you can see the um, different domains. You might notice phonological awareness, phonics, and uh, high-frequency words. Those are typically um, elementary skills, And but if you have students who are learning the English language um, or 
who have big gaps in their learning they could be behind in that area as well and we're seeing that as the case this is our um, bath diagnostic um, and um, similarly 15 percent above grade level 16 percent early 42 percent uh, one grade level below so that's a bigger um, a bigger uh, span than we saw in ela but similarly we have about 28 percent of students who are um, two or more grade levels below and then um, this is math at uh, middle school and again about 28 percent of our students are two or more grade levels below all right so let's talk a little bit about progress monitoring um, this year and, and we have our end of unit assessments being uh, revised and um, recreated in performance matters to engage students more in their assessments taking advantage of the rich interaction types that performance matters allows uh, and the nice thing about that is that when students take assessments in the platform then teachers and principals are able to analyze the data learn more about where students are in their learning and can then um, respond with intervention or um, changes, shifts in their instruction. So you see here uh, the common assessments. These are all most, uh, mostly unit one assessments so far. Um, and here is an example of the kind of data that a teacher or a principal could, could see. So in this first column, we just have this overall percentage um, score and that's helpful. But what is really helpful are the other three columns, which provide a score by standard. So teachers aren't looking at a 75% on a test and wondering what to do. With this program, they're able to understand students learning on a standards-based level and respond um, to that. So when we have the SBA and we have iReady and we have uh, common assessments by standards in performance matters, we can get a very good picture of student learning and actionable data for teachers and principals. For example, uh, here we have at the top a student's level four on the SBA, uh, early sixth grade on their iReady, scored a 56% on their first common assessment, but um, on these two standards, did very, very well. Uh, two out of two on those two standards. So this is a student uh, where we might, be able, might need to dig into some additional standards where, that are on this test, but not somebody of great concern. They're doing well in the classroom, tier one instruction. Here's a student who's a level four, scored a level five, so fifth grade on their iReady scored very high on the test and um, scored high on the standards of that test. And so while they're a level five, they are a sixth grader and we wouldn't expect them necessarily to be at sixth grade in September. So this might be a student who's just on track and we'll work with them in the normal way. Here we have a student who's a level two on the SBA, a level five on their diagnostic, and then a 38% on the test didn't meet standard on either of the standards. So this is a student we would want to make sure the teacher is connecting with and understands that they struggled in their last SBA, so they may have gaps in their learning. That diagnostic gives very clear information about where those gaps are, and they are struggling now in the classroom. That's really the power of this progress monitoring tool. Really, it allows us to take those trailing and leading indicators and put them all together and really sort of triangulate on the students learning and help us to know what to do informing our instruction and our interventions. Um, the last part of this is that when a teacher does give an assessment in the um, system and this is algebra two, check your readiness. So this would be a test given just prior to a unit of instruction to understand if students have the prerequisite skills to understand the coming instruction. So we have the standards that they're exposed to, probably algebra, a little bit of um, geometry um, in there as well. And teachers can see where students performed on each of these standards. 
And then they have the ability to analyze student responses to identify specific learning misunderstandings and um, identify those students who might need a reteach or a reminder about you know, certain rules. Because even if you're in Algebra 2, you might have forgotten something from Algebra 1 or Geometry. So this is a very powerful tool for the teacher who gives a test in the system to um, really dig down into the standards and know how to approach their teaching of a unit and then giving the end of unit assessment in the system that he can see um, how students have progressed against the standards of that unit. And that is all I have for you. Are there any questions? Yes, directors and student reps. I, I any just, questions? I just have a couple of questions. Um, uh, based on my um, the IRs um, and my visit to, to school, I did see some uh, the fifth grade team at, at one of, at one of the schools um, doing this, looking at that data and using words like, "Oh, when we really look at this, uh, they're missing on the the close reading because they're all missing this concept." And so it was really wonderful to hear that. Um, so I I do appreciate seeing that the, this data being used. Um, my second question is because of the IR today, um, I had a question um, that the school has a focus on third graders because of that candor that mm -hmm. it wasn't just this is how many kids are, are succeeding, it was this is how many kids aren't. And we have a real problem with our third graders not being um, being one or two grade levels down. So when I was at looking at the second grade class and then looking at the second grade data, you don't have kids in second grade and neither did the school that had were below like two years, but a quarter of the second graders are at least one year. So that even in the fall, they're not working as I believe at the second grade level. And I saw that in the iReady stickers that I saw in the second grade classroom today. And so I just wonder, and I know we've talked about it for years that we can't test the kids in SBA in second grade, but are we preparing second graders to move into third grade. Mm -hmm. And since second grade really is, especially with math, fundamentals of, of addition mm -hmm. and seeing how numbers really work together before you get into third grade with multiplication and division, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I just wonder if a quarter of this aren't even at grade level, that just seems like a huge number of second graders that we have an opportunity for. Right. And they have the iReady diagnostic and the end of unit common assessments in the um, system. And so that is how they identify what those gaps are and where they are and respond to them. Thank you. Director, Director Mason. I first want to thank you for such a great presentation. I thought you did such an excellent job of really um, capturing where we are and where we need to go and helping us understand it in a very layman's term for us non <laughs> um, data people like you. Um, I, I kind of was looking over this presentation and thinking of Clint Eastwood and the good, bad and ugly. <laughs> you know, it's kind of the number, the overall numbers are quite sobering. Um, and we know that and it's a national problem. It's not just an Everett public schools. Um, but I have to say it was pretty exciting to see those charts, the um, slide 17 and 18 and 19, um, because we're doing really well for um, where we are right now. And I just want to thank everyone in the room, actually everyone in the district for that. Um, and then I, I do have a, a bit of wondering on the high science numbers in high school, whether that's a, um, a change in curriculum or a testing timing thing, um, because it, it's really strong. And, and I want to just know a little bit more about that. Um, and then um, what else? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just excited to see where our new math curriculum takes us once it's um, in our system long enough to really get a foothold. So yeah. thank you. Director Herman. Yeah. yeah, wow, that's that's it's always a lot of data and I really appreciate um, all of your work. Uh, also, the kudos for the achievement um, that we saw. Uh, that was exciting to see. Um, it's hard, of course, not to look at that, the graph and see the variability <coughs> between our schools, obviously. Um, and so it, it did make me wonder 
Um, there, there were pockets, though, of it seemed schools beating the odds. And then when you look down deeper, um, grade levels, you can see, and that's when we saw in the IRs, which was really exciting, and it getting down to the student level. Um, it, do, it does, and, and I'll be honest here, I, when I first heard about the restructuring of the regions, um, I, was, I wasn't sure. I, I feel very strongly about it now. Um, that that it, that there could be a lot of collaboration. I want. I hope that those those groups that are outperforming, that are beating the odds, performing better than expected, are able to um, are able to work with with their cohort, their their peers. And um, so I'm I'm left feeling very hopeful for this year and progress going forward. Um, those that that category of three grade levels behind is also very sobering. Mm -hmm. I'm already wondering, can we do a repeat this next <laughs> summer of it's yes. going to be needed looking ahead. Um, and just keeping the fierce urgency uh, in in our schools, making sure parents are on board with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it reminded me of the analogy of the frog in the boiling water. I don't want us to get complacent. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Yeah. I just uh, wanted to add one last thing, or it was actually a question. It was the one I was searching for. It was the, the slides 29, 30, and 31 I loved so much. But the charts on um, slide 17, we typically historically have done those by free and reduced. Um, and and line the schools up and then where they wherever their markers are and I noticed this time it was flipped where it was just uh, the highest performance to the lowest performance is um, do we have an opportunity to look at it the other way or why why the change um probably I've done it in three years okay <laughs> um but yeah so we certainly can yeah look I at just it anyway. I I liked um the visual of when it you know you could see the outliers yeah. And mm -hmm. you could see the schools that, mm -hmm. you know, where things were going really well and where um, there was more struggles. So, yeah. yeah, thank you. We can get that for you. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I think we had it on sort of a line, like on a graph where mm -hmm. it was, mm -hmm. you know, if all the schools were above. And so it is, they're outperforming their poverty. Right. And it yeah, was, was kind of like the ones that we looked at compared to the other 25 districts, how, you know, you can tell so that's it's kind of fun to look at it individual school that way too yeah, yeah. especially some of the, the title schools that that you know if they can outperform what it's expected that's a celebration and not to look at the 28 and go how come it's 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 still a how come but they are outperforming expectation yeah director nichols just one question um do we have any idea <clears throat> on what impact if any the summer school programming had on our getting more folks up to grade level, getting our bounce back, our recovery? Um, well, I'm going to defer because um, I haven't done any kind of statistical analysis of it. Yeah. So in addition to, of course, credits being earned, which happen at high school, because we use the National Summer School Initiative materials, we actually tracked for standards that were being assessed. We saw growth between 15 and 44%, depending on the grade level, and whether it was in English language arts and math, there were ranges between those levels. So for, they pulled out priority standards, focused on that through the series of the four and five weeks, and that is what they were assessed at at the end with the pre and post tests. Is so, that primarily, excuse me, I had, is that primary high school or across all grades? So that, so those uh, were for grades one, first grade through fifth grade, and then for our middle school, six through eight. Our high school, it's through credits and grades. That's how we see, okay. see the growth. Excuse me. Director Nichols. So, I mean, it sounds like it's a pretty good return on our investment for the dollars that we invested on it. Absolutely. Um, this last yes, year, and we were so. able to account for it through those assessments as well. Yeah, I, I, that's something that I've always kind of uh, wondered about, and it's really nice to see the bounce back in these in these charts that we're getting back to where we were. Um, so, thank you. You're welcome. Student reps, do you have any questions? No, I I have a couple questions I'd like to ask. On slide six, 
where you show the general SBA and WACAS, there's an alternative. Can you explain what that alternative is and, mm -hmm. and why the difference in seventh grade math as well as sixth grade math on that alternative? So the WA-AIM is an alternative for students in, um, who are served in special education who meet certain qualifications. Um, and so the number of students in each of those groups is less than 20 in every grade level. So one of the um, reasons that there's great variation in the bar length or the percent proficiency is that if you have only 10 students, every student is 10%. Whereas if you have 1,500 general ed students, a single student is only going to represent one 1,500th of that um, bar. So um, they're just weighted um, mm -hmm. much, much higher. Well, I thank you very much for the data and the hard work that you put in to show us this data. I am very glad that you showed us the cohort data. I'm very happy to see that because the concern I have is how are the kids progressing from third grade, those same third grade students when they get to seventh grade, and how well are they coming back to normal, or rather coming back up in their performance. That's important to note, and I see that rise. And I am hopeful, just like Director Nichols, that summer school that we offer and will continue to offer, hopefully, free for all students to get back up because the pandemic is showing us one thing is that it's going to take more than one or two years to get our kids back up to, to where they were prior to the pandemic. And that's a good thing. My other concern is that we, you know, it shows us, the data shows us that math is very important. And if we want our kids to perform very well in those higher upper grade level math classes in high school, we need to start preparing them in the third and the fifth and the fourth, those lower grades and get them prepared. My only concern is, as it, the data shows, is that in math, sometimes we see a dip. What do you feel or what do you think is in that performance? They do so well in third, fourth, and fifth grade. And then once they get in the middle school and high school, there is a dip. What, what do you think we need to focus in on to ensure that we don't see a low, you know, a re reduction, but we see an increase in their performance? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I will say that um, math lags at the state level. And, um, you know, statewide, we see students' performance over time decrease. Um, I'm not sure that I can pinpoint um, an exact reason. I do know that uh, with the illustrative math curriculum and the shift in our instructional practices, that they're very much um, aligned to helping students meet those standards. Um, yeah. If I could just, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to piggyback on that for an ask that um, I know we, we, we spend a lot of time um, working with teachers and building personnel as far as knowing how to use the data, um, you know, how to support their students when they see that one student is, is doing the other. But I am curious to see over the long haul what we do with this data for friends. Um, you know, are we finding systemic issues, whether it be curriculum or the way it's delivered or things like that, um, that and, and how we're addressing those. So in, in the future, as we use this data, um, I'd love to have some sort of update on that. Because it could just be that, you know, kids, I would too. kids are kid and, and yeah. there's lots of variability, but it could be it, a systemic problem. It could be. And that, that's what, that's my question. I'm trying. So thank you very much, Doc, uh, Mr. Uh, Director Nichols. I was going to say Dr. Nichols, but Director Nichols, I appreciate that. But that is important. I just think over time with math, we have to look at the minutes of math instruction, especially in our um, uh, middle school and secondary. Um, just for a point of privilege, um, we're pleased but not satisfied with our data. You know, uh, we are definitely. Uh, Beating our, our other uh, districts by the hard work of the system, uh, like uh, many of you said, uh, and Director Mason said it, that kudos to the staff and kudos to the board, because to our public, we did the structural reviews during COVID when 
many thought we were, why are we doing this during COVID? Right? We didn't stop teaching. So to our teachers and staff in the system, it is a huge kudos. Um, and as we continue making the gains that we need to make, we will then eventually get our national merits that we need to get as well. It's all part of the entire system. The data point that you, you say so well, um, all of you, is, the, is very important to communicate out to our public that we are becoming more and more data savvy, right? And we're becoming more and more using this as a tool, right? If we could look at our students and say, how do we find their weaknesses and how do we find their strengths? That will permeate through the district. And, and you see it a lot, a little different flavor now, the instructional reviews, right? You go to, they're more prescriptive. And if you do that over time, you'll see uh, gains. The nation is 36 months behind. The nation is 36 months behind. How hard was it to be in a box and to learn? So uh, we have to continue being that trend. Uh, respectfully, I will tell you that summer school is wonderful, but it's not the cure-all. We got to do it during the day. And we got to find extended tutoring during after hours and find those kids that need tutoring and extra help. And during the day, we maximize our instruction. So we don't wait for the summer slide or wait to catch up at summer school. Um, and we're on that path. Okay, as you see, we've made, we've made gains and we've made, you know, but we got to continue doing that. And when you hear about the iReady and the performance matters and all the tools, because they are tools of how we look at the total child, right? We talk about instruction. And then last Friday, we had social emotional learning. Boom, they hit together. They hit together, the total child. So we just have to keep doing that. I'm very proud of staff about their laser focus on student achievement. Our system is a K-12 system. We start in K to get to 12th out of those great graduation rates. So I just want us to continue thinking about that. But I have to publicly say that the board allowed us to continue the work when a lot of districts said, let's not go, you know, let's slow down totally. And then we would have been in even, you know, more detriment for our students. So I appreciate your student centered focus. It means a great deal to the system. And again, to our teachers and staff, you've done an amazing job. Thank you. I do want to also make a comment too, Director Herman, the urgency is now, is it's upon us. And I am also concerned about the region, regional difference in the outcomes, because that urgency or that realization is essentially by zip code. And the urgency of getting all kids up to the standard so that we can depend on successful kids throughout their lives and we're talking about global kids and i know we compare with state but we have to con you know and we know this three years or uh, two years essentially have been lost because of the pandemic throughout the whole world but these kids have got to be prepared for a global presence and and that's the urgency Thank you so much for the data that you provided. Thank you so much for your report. Are there any further questions from the board? Thanks so much. Thank you. We'll now move to section 13.0, which is unfinished business. And there is no unfinished business scheduled to come before the this board. Moving to section 14.0 is new business, and there is no new business schedule for this meeting. Section 15.0 is the upcoming agenda items. Dr. Salzman, what's planned for our upcoming agenda items? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and the public. At the November 8th regular meeting, the Board agenda will obtain the following. Recognition of the National Merit Scholar finalists. Legislative priorities, a spotlight on technology, OSPI equity dual credit grant, Perkins grant, CTE program evaluation, instructional and library surplus. At our special meeting on November 15th, the board will conduct the superintendent's evaluation. On November 17th, the special meeting, the board will participate in the WASDA annual conference in Spokane.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salzman. We'll now move to section 16.0, which is executive closed sessions. There is no executive closed session to come before the, the board tonight. We'll move to section 17.0, which is adjournment. This concludes the business scheduled to come before the board of directors during this meeting. This meeting stands adjourned.